Hello everyone. So today we talk about uh, Genghis Khan and giving um, uh, a general introduction about his figure and his times. Um, as you understand, as most of my videos, this is going to be a relatively um, synthetic um, uh, description, generally speaking. I, even if you see, but probably this video will last for more than one hour, but uh, let's see how it turns. Um, this doesn't mean that it is complete. Um, there is also a big deal of problems uh, relatively to the sources of Mongolian history, especially at the, the very beginning, uh, <coughs> because the Mongolian Empire had its history during the 13th century. It came eventually to to encompass many areas of Eurasia and, and all the um, developed civilizations, especially of southern um, Asia and, and Europe, um, kind of um, talked about the Mongols, so we know fairly a lot. But relatively to the origins of Temujin, of Temujin I, I don't know how you pronounce that, really, <coughs> there is a lot of, um, of, of myth, of legend, of legend surrounding uh, the figure and um, and allegiance are always important because even if they are not f if they are not factual history you can still um, grasp um, what was the interest of those who um, basically wrote them or or why um, <coughs> such a moment in history um, or or a certain character like Genghis Khan. Uh, um, were wanted to be depicted in in such a fashion, so they're they're still very um, important historically speaking, and they should be analyzed uh, exactly for this reason. So the the general idea um, about the history of the Mongols is that we have to contextualize it, to contextualize them in. Uh, in a broader picture that it's not that one day that the Mongolians came out of the steppes. First of all, who were the Mongolians? This is also a very interesting question, but let's say that there, was al there has always been this huge world of the Eurasian steppes um, that really had, the, I don't know, as Westerners, we I think we, we have completely forgotten in some measure because we don't even consider it as Western uh, in practice, which is a huge mistake, at least relatively to the uh, Iranian branch of the Indo-Europeans, um, but mo most importantly, this area and and the peoples who, who dwelled in there had always a, a great impact on the uh, histories of um, the sedentary uh, civilization that dwelled uh, into other uh, uh, regions of Eurasia, uh, and they always had a great role even in developing them. Uh, you know, if you take the migration era, you, you understand that this had, uh, even if we consider it as this narrow part of the late antique and early medieval European history, uh, it, telling the truth, it, it's, it's something that um, had a great impact on, on, the lo on our civilization. And by the way, the migration era properly never um, never stopped because uh, it wasn't practically um, something that um, uh, that you know uh, until these peoples were in sedentarized in recent times there was nothing like a uh, proper um, end of the steppes culture and of, of their migrations so even uh, the migration era in itself should be um, uh, pre um, you know predated I mean if you take even the 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 Cimbrians and the Teutonists that were put in motion uh, in, in the first century BC. I mean, those were peoples that didn't ina inhabit the steppes, but I mean, were, they were still peoples on the march. I mean, from the from <coughs> certain areas of even of Europe, take the Carpathian steppes that have, have always been, for instance, a target for the Eastern. Uh, um, horse riding peoples because of the Hungarian plan and all. I mean, there was always a very deep contact between Europe, especially in, in Central and Eastern Europe, obviously. Even if you take a country like Germany, you understand that, you know, where's been really the frontier of Germany? That there isn't properly one, geographically speaking, right? So this really influenced our stories in a way that we, we really have to be mindful of. Today we won't be talking much about that, but rather the figure uh, about the figure of Genghis Khan.
and um, and generally speaking, um, uh, observing how there was really a new phase of motion of the uh, Mongolian peoples. Um, let's say during the really the 12th century so in the, the were, in the were usually the great migrations are always preceded by certain important changes in the area uh, changes that might be political uh, and social but that can be grounded also on the base of other environmental reasons um, which don't have to be stressed um, too much in turn uh, it's it's really a complex uh, um, amount of factors and the um, and, and, and this essentially nomadic mm, herdsmen that lived in today's eastern Mongolia and um, and even into Manchuria in practice um, were starting to to be extremely important for for the history of, of the world um, the names were different and uh, I don't know much about etymologies of these peoples and their language and all but uh, they were basically a confederation they were mm, they were generally speaking a confederation of peoples mm. uh, some of which were the Mongols uh, some were the Tatars so there were other other names and I don't know how much uh, and we shouldn't be um, mistaken at defining them uh, in a certain fashion uh, because for instance the term uh, Tatar or Tartar has, um, is a term to which the, for instance the Arabs called uh, these peoples as a whole but seemingly the Tatars were actually a clan of, the mo uh, of these greater confederations and uh, and this awakened by the way many also many um you know fantasies in the west because the the term ta tartar uh, was or tatar was uh, extremely similar to the tartars from the it's the latin world for the um <coughs> the, the pagan uh, hell so uh, even this idea of the peoples of Gog and Magog that had to come from the end of, of uh, the, the the ends of the world uh, to 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 really uh, create uh, <laughs> a mess into the the world uh, and all these biblical you know uh, ideas about I don't know even monstrous peoples and, and was still there and there was a lot that had to be um, that was fantasized by the Westerners. At the same time, this is what the Mongolian Empire eventually gave the same opportunity for the Westerners and not only to actually cross the Mongolian steppes because uh, when the, the Mongols basically unified for m at least nominally but it, it was really a, a, a very extended domination the, the, the Mongolian Empire was the, the most extended contiguous empire in the history um, I mean people could travel in there because all the um, take the Silk Road that was the major uh, highway in, in, in medieval history uh, uh, was definitely all belonging only to, to one leader so that there weren't so smaller leaders that were all making the merchant stops and paying tolls and also this um, the, the so-called Pax Mongolica that is the Mongolian peace um, really um, opened also many uh, opportunities to um, to the um, to the um, to these other people uh, to, to the Westerners to to eventually get to know the Mongols and to um, and to make them expand uh, and in, into their culture and know, getting to know that and I will surely discuss about this in other videos but <laughs> this is not the moment so in this uh, agitated steps you know that even in Europe there had been practically certain reflections I mean um, since the 8th century if you take peoples of, of Turkic Mongolic stock like the Khazars for instance um, that rose even before the, the states of Kiev and Nong Novgorod uh, um, and that, that they converted to, to Christianism under the Byzantine influence uh, had um, 
shifted in 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 the uh, in the uh, uh, in the west practically at least western compared to where they dwell dwelling for instance they converted mass to Judaism this is also an interesting thing the Khazars were Jewish in practice even though you know it's not that it was it was a state for which you know that was the official religion where there were a lot of pagans also Muslims and even of Christians among them but it's still interesting how these peoples were receptive of Western influences I mean you might think if you are a Khazar and you leave in Kazakhstan and all, and what do you care about these religions? And yet they were important because they could strengthen one lineage and its central. But what generally the the main problem these um, populations were that they w they weren't centralized. They were essentially a, a confederations uh, of um, theoretically independent peoples that uh, were. Um, uh, consuming themselves still uh, as free as we will be seeing here even uh, among the Mongols the in, in their there was no, no institutional <coughs> um, uh, construction practically and uh, the traditional um, idea of um, a sort of of free um, contract let's say among the world populations to get together to the world clans to get together to was still out there, uh, and naturally the Mongols were much more autocratic instead, where where they conquered uh, populations that were already used to 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 be ruled uh, in a sedentary fashion with a guy at the top with a bureaucracy. Take China, take um, take the, the Middle East, um, <laughs> and so on. Even if the degree uh, of control that eventually the Mongols had over these areas was relative in, in practice and, and in fact the Mongolian Empire eventually split up into essentially the pharaoh of, of these previous civilizations that they had incorporated and that, that eventually blended into and that conquered in this sense the, the, the conquerors as it happened many times in, in into history. Um, there were also in, in the West had known also the Kumans, by the way, um, that had that, that came later. Uh, the Khazars had been mm, practically uh, annihilated uh, uh, in um, in um, in later times, in, in the 12th century, at beginning in the 20s of the 12th century, practically. Um, and uh, the, um, um, the 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 Kumans had arrived later, and they created this great uh, empire, um, um, stretching essentially in southern Ukraine. Um, after mm, and that was also in competition with the, the Rus. Um, um, and then th there was also in, in Central Asia there were also other powers. Um, for instance, uh, south of the Balkash Lake, there was a, a sort of uh, a new, em let's, let's say, empire, a um, uh, nomad empire. They uh, called of the Karakitai, and uh, the and, and this was quite dangerous in that location because it was placed in the midst of the Silk Road. So and that was actually a concern, especially for the um, Chinese um, uh, Sang who. Um, we were also under attack from from these populations who called in, into their own help the uh, same uh, turco mongolian um, <coughs> populations uh, to to deal with them the Gurgit, if i'm not wrong that were dwelling between mongolia and manchuria and um and, and with with the only problem that these populations uh, eventually turned out to to, to do just the same <laughs> of the others and the chinese knew that but at a certain point they couldn't control it anymore i mean this uh, this is daily mm, business in those times take even the roman empire previously and um, the, the problem had been you know containing these populations and by turning them one against the other um, and uh, the um, and there were similar ideas telling the truth relatively to you know the idea of, of the barbarians. So, so think about the Great Wall of China. You know this idea of the border, the boundary, and all. Um, similar in this sense, China and Europe lived sometimes um, kind of similar, very similar situations. Um, 
And um, in the history of China, in this sense, was more troubled because eventually the Europeans, uh, yeah, did have mm, these mm, populations coming to the West, even through the Middle Ages, but they kind of um, um, they th th there was probably the, frag the same fragmentation of Europe kind of helped to absorb them, to to stem them, even in some uh, not really stemming, but really absorbing their impact. Think about the Bulgars, the Magyars, the um, and, and, and the others and how it had been for them. Uh, they basically disappeared. I mean today, yeah, countries like Hungary or Bulgaria do have this um, historical cultural legacy of um, these peoples of the steppes, but they're essentially um, almost Bulgaria is a Slavic country, for instance. Uh, Hungary is not really Slavic because they they have retained their their Turkic uh, language, but this is something that even the Finns, uh, the Finnish at least, better um, retained because of cal more cultural reasons than strictly ethnical ones. So, um, in 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 China, the problem of having a single block of an empire implied that when this block collapsed uh, you you lost practically that uh, benefits those benefits that <laughs> you had by controlling it i mean even the same china was structured in a more centralized way than than europe in this sense um, because it had lasted longer even china got fragmented even china got in its early middle ages this this explosion essentially of the previous empires but um, and, and they grew mixed to, with the new invaders and all. So, very complicated history, but we can't talk about uh, it uh, it now. And the, uh, the the great problem, however, strategically speaking, was uh, for, for the sedentary populations was f for these nomadic peoples not to unify under the, the uh, a great leader was known uh, in their culture as the Khan. Uh, so uh, here we have Genghis Khan, in fact, that um, uh, means uh, the the uh, the universal um, uh, lord, I, I think. Um, and um, the, the his name was really Temujin. Hmm? Uh, Temujin had uh, an extraordinary life, indeed. Not much, I believe, for what he accomplished later, which is what we we think. Uh, of course, because it gave rise to the Mongolian Empire, it conquered um, literally half of, of the world. But also, and especially, in my opinion, for his youth and actually the odds that he, he had to overcome in order to, to eventually unify the, the Mongols, say unify, let's say to, to, to guide them, to rule them. And to, um, to to arrive to that point and and to just to survive in practice um, in in the West we we all know who Genghis Khan was but um, <laughs> differently from Alexander the Great uh, we haven't really absorbed him as a kind of a our national. Um, uh, hero in practice. First of all, because he was a Westerner, so uh, that that is obvious with Alexander, who, who spoke Greek and came from Macedon. So we kind of had and, and gave rise to to a world that is substantially Westerner, and it was also <coughs> relatively Western at this time, because even the Persian Empire had strong uh, Indo-European influences, and so our populations of Anatolia and so on. Um, but in Asia, definitely Genghis Khan is um, its definitely a controversial figure, I'm sure, because not all uh, historiographies are alike, and not all Asian countries are alike. Um, obviously, a Mongolian today has... A, 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 Genghis Khan is considered the father of modern Mongolia in practice. Um, even if I in here it, it's also an historiographical construction because indeed the, the Mongolians were what they were even before in, in under many points of view and, and relatively Mongolia hasn't changed much uh, as much let's say after Genghis Khan than uh, what China did, what Iran did, what even Eastern Europe did um, <coughs> because eventually Mongolian society remained at least essentially the same. This, this one of the characteristics of these nomadic peoples is that they 
they uh, they basically left the Eurasian steppes. So they didn't build their empires in, into there simply because they couldn't, practically, because environmentally speaking, uh, that's the reason why there were no empires uh, in the steppes, if not this kind of domination, very fluid and unstable dominations. Uh, if you take Indian history, if you take Chinese history, if you ta take Persian history, if you take the uh, Eastern Europe history, I mean, there were Khanates that survived for centuries and that s massively influenced the local uh, histories and all. Um, so for saying that uh, we as Westerners haven't interiorized Genghis Khan as a as a hero, as someone who has given us something in practice, but in Asia, basically the figures of Alexander the Great was a hero like even in the Muslim world. Um, and Genghis Khan are extremely um, important. I mean, there is something atavic, something um, uh, really spiritual also in part in, into his uh, invasions, in, into his <laughs> endeavors. Sorry. And uh, we, we don't even know when uh, Temujin was born. Um, we, we oscillate, I have read he might have been born um, preferably around one, um, 1162, but uh, I, at least I know that the, d the dates can range between 1155 and 1167, so um, you have to think of Mongolia like being really steps. Um, with the nomadic populations that didn't have written records. I mean, Genghis Khan made a lot even to give a, um, uh, a, written, um, a written language to the Mongols, the Ugrian script. Um, but before, these populations didn't write anything, so we have to rely, even historically speaking, on things that were just written later and that, you know, obviously have uh, a lower degree of of precision than than, than something that could have been written down at that time. Um, he wa Temujin was the son of a, um, a chieftain hmm, that lived uh, seemingly settled, settled in the high uh, Onon uh, river that, that is roughly east of the Baikal Lake. Um, and uh, the um, the, 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 the sad thing about his um, his youth uh, is that basically uh, his father got uh, poisoned by some enemies of during a um, an invasion actually the, uh, the story tells that uh, he was uh, offered the submission of his enemies and they gave them food they gave him food. Uh, as a recognition of sovereignty, and he said the food was poisoned, so the father died. Um, and when Temuyin came back among the Mongols, the Mongols were this uh, clan, okay, that existed among others, uh, including the Karahits, the Tatars, uh, as we will see right now. And he was, uh, when he came back among the Mongols, basically he was um, refused his uh, heritage as son of his father, um, <coughs> as a chieftain. So basically he um, he was an outcast, he was ex expelled. I mean you have to take into consideration that these clans, when, when, when they got beheaded by a, a leader that was usually also a, a military leader, so someone who um, for his ability, capabilities had managed to, to keep things in order to rule over someone who was practically able to, to maintain power, um, the, the the relative clan was r literally uh, beheaded and it could be ex expelled or submitted by someone else. So basically Temuyin fled at this point and he spent part of his youth in into um, into misery, like dwelling, uh, you know, sur trying to survive in the steppes, eating cor uh, carcasses or uh, haunting mm, mm, <laughs> small um, uh, steps, rats, or s stuff like that. So he had a very tough, uh, he learned um, the lessons of life in a very hard way. Um, and yet, uh, he is, um, then I don't know, much is legend as well, so I, I am not giving you this as factual history, but um, and, and, and in fact, uh, in, in virtue of his um, lineage, I mean, for being his father's son, 
Um, he was eventually um, adopted uh, in virtue of this by um, the Karaites, uh, the Karaite king, the Karaite uh, uh, chieftain. The Karaites were a another population of, of these uh, Mong Mongolian steppes. Some say that they are of Turkic uh, origin, uh, not a Mongolian one, and we don't really know because these peoples were so mixed that you know, to a certain extent it doesn't even make sense to, to have these sharp divisions. Um, um, these were one, one of the clans that ex existing there was relatively powerful and by the way at this time um, the Mongolians were in very strict contact with China because China was trying to divide them and to make uh, to turn one against the other so all these clashes actually took place into this m picture practically um, and adopting a son um, uh, of of basically of an, uh, of an extremated um, uh, clan obviously equated to uh, raise a um, um, someone who had nothing to lose like Timoyin at that point and who could be practically eventually recognized as a leader into maybe that clan once that the enemies uh, would have been taken down because the killers of his father were now fighting as well with the Karaites and he was also uh, uh, Timoyin was also waging war against them um, so the Karaites hoped that uh, at one point could place this adoptive son uh, as a political pawn among the, the Mongols uh, in order for, for their power to be extended over them. And he even married um, the, um, the, the daughter of the Karaites uh, chieftain, which was a great honor. Her name was Berte, or Borte, I don't know how you want to pronounce that. And that was even more meaningful because eventually uh, Borte was um, captured by the Karaites' enemies and, and Temuin was sent by them to, to, to fight against um, these kidnappers. So he was, um, this is important because it gives you the dimension of how fully uh, he had managed to, to get involved into the, um, the political mm, matters of, of, these, uh, of the Karaite uh, clan. And and, uh, and and which role of, of prestige uh, in the sense he had he had achieved. Um, so in all this, he basically managed to defeat all his enemies. Um, he got defeated in turn, uh, actually more than once. So it was a very um, fluid situation in the step that that is really the normality. There there is continuous warfare because. Um, and there is no other way to have greater incomes if not defeating an enemy and seizing his pastures and and uh, and eventually starting it over again <laughs> to en to enlarge uh, your your own power. So with uh, with the time he rose um, through the ranks, let's say by clashing and defeating and, and carrying, uh, you know, when there was a victorious uh, leader in the steppes, th the normality was that other clans would follow uh, him, or even free uh, warriors because uh, uh, adventurers, because that was the um, the occasion to to share the loot. Hmm? And 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 that was really the success. What uh, the political success in the steps really was. I mean, great confederations in this sense were uh, kept together by the effectiveness of the leaders, because it was it was believed that it could provide for his to his subjects uh, enough uh, uh, booty to to be satisfied uh, in practice. So by 1206, uh, the uh, entire area of Gobi was under Temuin's uh, domain, um, and at the um, say tribal council, tribal diet, uh, the uh, the great Kurithai, mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the springs of the Onon uh, River, he, uh, Temuin was named as Great. Khan, that is the supreme Khan, essentially, of all the Mongols that had now practically found th these huge confederations. Uh, the Mongols, as not as te just as Temuin's clan, but really the, the, the whole 
um, the the world group of of populations of the Mongolian plan um, um, that had to find a sort of cohesion. We can say national, maybe in very uh, in very Latin terms, because that that is what the natio in or natio in Latin is practically. Um, and and that's where he also got the sir the, the nickname <laughs> Genghis uh, Khan that is the universal lord so uh as we were saying before uh Genghis Khan really didn't have a um uh, he was um a conqueror um and also an organizer of peoples he um you have to think also that in in a nomadic context uh one thing that you can do actively is literally to to deport uh or or simply to make move a people from a place to another so to resettle the balances in certain regions to settle maybe i don't know one people in in an area where wh where you want to keep in check one of your personal enemies and all and and in this context it was not possible to carry out any other form of government uh, it, there could have never been something like an institutional reform um, there could be definitely uh, s certain kind of adjustments but they, they all came from agreements in terms of mutual um, uh, of mutual interest let's say and not really because th there could be anything centralized uh, in practice um, so even his laws uh, his decisions in this sense uh, were emanated as great can uh, actually came from the same uh, local Mongolian traditions we're talking about as about herdsmen um, mostly as uh, horse um, um, uh, owning uh, great herds of horses of of camels and goats so really m even people who had essentially uh, been living in that fashion with, with no great uh, further you know m modification to their lifestyle so um, the, the, the the really mm, Genghis Khan's legislation in this sense was more a um, sort of mm, of sanction of things that were coming definitely as normal um, or maybe just guided uh, changes and transitions and these tribes by the way were continuously on the march for the search of, of fresh pastures and they um, uh, they they could extend, for instance, uh, more or less fast. That that is also a, a an actual problem. You have to think that these guys didn't have obviously maps. They they oriented themselves just with the skies, and yet they know they knew perfectly where a certain tribe was uh, settling and eventually expanding, and how to control and keep them in check, or allowing that considering the balance and all. Um, so the uh, the empire of Genghis Khan, in this sense, uh, was growing in steps as uh, just as a big domination, mm -hmm. um, and as a great mobile empire because uh, he was moving too. Of course, um, there was this very great political and military organization that really was based on the dynamics of uh, mobilization of the Mongolian people according to the environmental um, conditions and uh, the, um, the the idea is uh, however that there, there was a progressive hierarchization of this system because you, if you can't impose a centralized government at least you can try to favor um a certain um guy let's say more than one other Th this is kind of similar to feudalism in practice because uh, the the can could decide just uh, obviously in a very different context and with very different practices but just like a western king let's say to to give a certain land to someone hmm? Uh, implying, and this is also another similarity, that that land was given by the Khan, mm, was given by the king, so not really pretending that was a, uh, a permanent 
um, a permanent uh, settlement. Mm -hmm. So in, in this way, just like in feudalism, you can favor basically a bunch of guys who have a greater power. Then in this sense, in this sense, can also grow dangerous for your own power. But that uh, through them, uh, you can control. But through which you can can control a greater part of peoples. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier in order to govern uh, such, especially such a large empire like the one. Um, that Genghis Khan was creating in the steppes to really um, uh, dialogue with, with less chieftains, so to have a direct um, the uh, you know the the the, aware, the how can I say the security of of um, giving an order to someone that that in this sense could could carry it out in, in a very large amount of land instead of having a, a um, hundreds of chieftains, uh, everyone doing whatever they they wanted with a fragmented power would have been impossible practically to to control. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, this is what also sedentary um, uh, uh, empires were doing when dealing with such populations, like the Chinese or the Byzantines were doing exactly the same. They were trying uh, not to weaken the guys, uh, or at least not always, obviously turning them one against the other was an option. But it was also um, profitable for them to have a privileged interlocutor, someone that could maybe stop these uh, warlike peoples and give them a, a, a discipline, maybe not to um, to, to, to enter uh, in small groups and um, I into the uh, into the empire to trespass the, the the borders and therefore dealing just one with one guy that was in charge of the whole thing so this was kind of a, a mandatory passage but just a great leader just someone who had a, a lot of power could give this more orderly asset mm -hmm. Um, but uh, as we were saying, by tradition, the, the, the all the various uh, clans remained formally independent. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the 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 can basically limited itself to place um, um, certain characters that that were part of the let's say the the, the imperial family, the, the so-called house of the uh, golden uh, stock, let's say, um, that uh, was considered holy, religiously speaking, because uh, it was being generated by the, um, the, uh, the greatest um, divinity of the Mongolian people, that was Tengri, Tengris if I, in English I believe it is, that, is, that was the sky. Mm. The Mongol, and this is the the usage of religion for the sake of centralization. Centralization is something excruciatingly important in in nomadic uh, history. That is something that you find even during the migration era among the Germanic po peoples that were fiercely egalitarian, and and the dynasts that were chosen to make uh, the people migrate began to to add maybe the story that they were descendants of a certain god to um, basically um, trying to impose their own dynastic um, um, authority over over the world people. This is what the, the Mongolians were doing. The Mongolians were practically uh, animistic yeah, in the sense that they didn't have, they weren't uh, they didn't have really structured polytheistic pantheon. They believed um, that was um, um, a, a whole load of um, of deities that lived, uh, I don't know, in the rivers, in the mountains, in the trees, and 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 the greater one was the one of the sky that dominated from the above. And this was really the the great. I mean, the sky is extremely important in the steppes because first of all, it's essentially all what you can see aside from land. Uh, and um, and there is also in, in to these relig people's religions there is an excruciatingly important relation between the horse that is symbol of life and and death uh, and the um, and the sky um, because uh, it is meant um, you know the the, the horse the, the, um, you have to think that the Mongols were 
uh, as uh, I believe most of you already know, um, fighting, uh, you know, and leading actually <laughs> the world lives on horseback. So they were practically um, um, living uh, together with their horse, and the horse was the same symbol of, of the warrior practice in practice that could lead him uh, to the sky eventually after his death but the the horse is also an animal that is strictly connected into these religions to the heart because it's very um, um, physical very um, very uh, I don't know how to say bloaty in its in its strength in its appearance and therefore it is this very mystical um, um, bridge between the uh, the underground and the sky. The same goes with uh, with I uh, iron weapons. Um, that um, metallurgy was extremely advanced among uh, the steppes populations, and equally the uh, the metals came from the underground. Uh, and very uh, very eventually um, worked uh, to to turn them into into blades into armor. Uh, with all um, certain religious rituals that emphasize the magic character of the metal, um, it's important. And it was all one with ca with the cavalry. It was all one with the um, <laughs> with the idea of using this uh, thing for war. So war was extremely important in uh, in their in their own um, culture. Um, the, um, the, so the, the, really the nucleus of the uh, Mongolian Empire remained even after Genghis Khan and the, the creation of the greater empire, basically the, the so-called Ulus. Mm -hmm. There was the unity uh, of the tribe built up around its, um, its property practically. So in this sense even the, the Mongolian Empire was conceived in the same fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the, the conquered lands became to be the ulus of the imperial family as a personal, as a private property, and the singular khans kept to, to have, uh, for this very reason, a very great uh, autonomy, exactly uh, for, because um, they could, they were free essentially to dispose of this uh, power, because it, it, it really belonged to them, personally speaking. However, they were all kept um you know in um in the, they had to sh to be faithful to the great can mm. there were there was a very strongly mystical uh, bond and this is i find incredible how many uh similarities there are with the uh for the Germanic populations of the migration era really here into the nomadic context because uh, they were really similar in terms of society of the idea of the uh, military retinue of the uh, of the uh, personal possessions that were um, obtained through the conquest and all so all these um, uh, rights and and and, uh, and, um, and uses and traditions that w w were forged um, in this fashion because they corresponded to the Really, to the logic, the political and military logics that uh, was at the base of these uh, of these dominion uh, these dominations uh, in practice, and there was also great control eventually during the Mongolian Empire on, uh, from the, the let's say uh, from the Great Khan wherever he was. Technically speaking, uh, the there was a, um, I can't say a permanent, but there was an ideal seat of the Khan into Mongolia. Mm. That was the the place of origin that the, the Mongolians never forgot to came from, and theoretically speaking it was also, and also practically, because you know, Mongolia in this sense is placed at the center of Asia. Yeah, it's a bit more north and, and east compared to the, um, to the whole Mongolian domains. But it's actually the um, the crossroad because if you want to go to China, if you want to uh, want to go to India, if you want to go to Iran, if you want to go to Europe, uh, passing f uh, through the steppes with those horses that uh, with, with those very tough breeds of the steppes that can that could make the Mongolian armies sweeping uh, extremely fastly throughout Eurasia for 
uh, crossing uh, tens of thousand kilometers um, could work well uh, in there so if um, a can wanted to control everyone it, that was also a very good central position to eventually move um, for their military expeditions the Mongols in this sense were really um, um, literally uh, doing a, a campaign uh, every year N and, and that was by the way the only concrete mean they had to keep um, their 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 empire um, um, subjugated because uh, it, it was a deterrent in practice so uh, it, that was enough to to keep the, the local populations su subjugated um, even though the, the Mongolian rule wasn't extremely oppressive uh, usually these peoples um, didn't have a great uh, uh, they definitely inherited the fiscal system and bureaucratic systems that were present to the sedentary territories that they conquered, but they were um, they had a lighter hand in economical terms, um, while having a very ir a, 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 an iron fist in case of rebellion. So that is kind of intelligent because if you show that these populations that you had to pay uh, are relatively few to compared to what you were used to and and that if you disobeyed you 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 would have been exterminated well that guy is gonna be um, uh, paying <laughs> your taxes so this was a huge empire and um, the, the Mongolian armies by the way were um, you know local historiographies of the sedentary populations like to emphasize the huge numbers of the Mongolians but telling the truth um, the greatest strength of the Mongolian army laid into uh, their um, their organization and in this sense also their uh, relative agility so sometimes if you really study in detail the Mongolian campaigns you'll see that most of the times their their armies were smaller uh, even actually than the, the one of the populations that they subjugated so sometimes these populations eventually uh, said that the the enemy was were the Mongolians were, uh, you know, they had huge armies to stress this fear, this I I even to kind of uh, justify their own defeat. But really, um, the Mongolian armies were mm, much better in quality than in number, mm. um, and they proved that. Uh, the um, so. The um, relatively to the uh, f the beliefs of the Mongolians, uh, there is also another factor that has to be taken into consideration. That is, uh, essentially, that their religion had um, was very fitting for the um, for for actually integrating and and um, um, and create a synchrosis with uh, religions like. Buddhism, Christianism, uh, Islam. Um, essentially because, as we have seen, they, the Mongolians believed in a sort of um, cosmic monotheism. I mean, yes, there were all these um, animistic and shamanistic presences of spirits that inhabited the, uh, the, the world, but these were minor uh, deities. The, the great and absolute god was the one of the sky. So this kind of resembled a form of monotheism, and you have to think, by the way, that even the um, the, the the other uh, like Buddhism, Christianism, and Islam were in medieval times very loaded, even with this uh, ancient pagan um, background of multiple mm, smaller deities. Like in the Christian religion, these had been transformed into the saints, the angels, and all. But these are all things that came from a... Even the Muslims have that. The, the angels are very prominent into the Quran. Buddhism, w Buddhism was born as a sort of... Um, Buddhism, Buddhism is probably not even a monotheism as such. But it was um, um, a religion or a philosophy, how you want to call it, that initially was based exactly on the uh, refusal towards um, paganism. Hmm. And that instead, when it expanded all over Asia, basically transformed itself into a paganism because every th because the local populations who were pagans began to build um, statues of Buddha and to venerate them. 
as even a, a, a singular local entity that that could make miracles and also really transforming um, the world Buddhism meaning Jainism did instead the, the, the same exact contrary but relatively to the point now uh, the Mongols in this sense were very open to the idea of having a unique deity mm? um, and uh, especially Genghis Khan was personally extremely interested by the uh, these religions and uh, more even more specifically uh, to the um, to Taoism, that is this um, religion or philosophy, as you want to call it, that that does have a sort of cosmic um, ideal. And uh, and why was Genghis Khan interested in it? It, it is because he was so open-minded for being a Mongolian. Um, in certain verses, yes, because all great. Um, rulers have a degree of open-mindedness but relatively to this <laughs> really the reason is that uh, he was extremely curious about uh, the, li the legend according to which the Taoists uh, the, the, the wise um, the Taoist wise men actually um, knew and concealed the um, the secret formula for immortality hmm? Um, so Genghis Khan was extremely fascinated about this. You have to think even about the psychology. You, you don't have to modernize uh, mentally these these characters. You have to understand them for, for what they really were. I mean, uh, it would I don't know what I'd give to know what wh how Genghis Khan <laughs> reasoned like. But there is an explanation for this because um, animistic populations, and generally speaking, populations that um, that do not have a great cultural resistance towards other cultures do not really see any problem into accepting other beliefs. Mm. I mean the greatest reaction to accepting another belief actually comes from polytheism relatively um, and especially from the monotheisms because they basically tend to exclude the other beliefs. Actually polytheists uh, do adopt other deities, because the idea of a polytheist is that he's not even a polytheist. I mean, the polytheist uh, term is is a monotheistic invention. If you live in a world in which you think that there are many gods, the more you accept them into your pantheon, and the, the better it is. Always being cautious about not getting someone uh, angered or not. Um, so this is why even polytheism can be intolerant in some ways, but especially animistic pe peoples um, do not have this form of, um, of um, or at least uh, the, the, uh, their resistance to the adoption of other beliefs is, is much milder. And this is, by the way, what you can see as well relatively to the Christianization of the Germans uh, that were also animistic in practice, not polytheistic during the migration era, um, who, in this sense, Christianized quite easily. You know, they, they kept obviously believing their own um, pagan uh, ideas, but they, they still were capable of integrating Christianism with them. There is, I don't know why today this this uh, absolutely historical false uh, myth of the false historical myth of the Germans as uh, in medieval times as um, the one who were the toughest to Christianize. I mean sometimes it was different but it was usually because of political reasons like with the Saxons with uh, Charlemagne. But if you take, I don't know, Iceland that was also one of the most conservative, uh, I mean one of the most traditionalist um, no, um, Northmen societies. I mean, they they converted spontaneously without no imposition in in less than two generations. So the truth is that the Mongols uh, seemingly uh, um, could could include all the many beliefs that um, that that they uh, they they came across. By the way, w uh, when um, with when they um, when they began to to invade other countries and to know other cultures, so sometimes you you say that you 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 see Britain things like ah oh, the Mongolians were so tolerant, 
Uh, this is a typical modern mo uh, mi mistake because uh, the modern person reasons uh, thinks that toler on average at least thinks that tolerance is what we have created in the West after the Treaty of um, of Westphalia and the settlement of the uh, religious matters after the Thirty Years' War and the division between church and state and therefore the recognition that you can have different beliefs and that they have to be in this sense tolerated and accepted uh, because you accept that someone can uh, have a different opinion from yours in those worlds this concept did not exist I mean if you screwed up because you, you insulted a god you got slaughtered okay so this is not religious tolerance actually the Mongols came even to regulate certain um, certain rights certain things I mean they, they, they had their own saying into what certain um, religious communities had or didn't have to do so even this concept of tolerance is not completely true but it is true, however, that um, that in this sense, religious questions were relatively um, accepted in general. I mean, if, if, if unless there wasn't a particular reason for not doing that, it's it's like with Romans and Christianism. Basically, the Romans were intolerant. People say, well, the Romans were tolerant. Well, not really, because. All they cared about was to basically ex uh, to tolerate any form of, of of other deities, which was normal for a polytheistic world. But they had to impose their own imperial deity to 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 everyone. So if you refused to accept that deity, uh, you 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 got slaughtered. O of course, the Romans weren't so brutal. There were a lot of uh, you know, there, there was all a bureaucratic juridical process for which you were asked if you were sure of this, but if you resisted, like the Christians did in, in a radical way, th that was conceived for becoming a problem. Um, so what what the, the Mongols were really interested in was to obtain practically the, um, the benevolence of all the gods that they met, of all the different cults and all these... Uh, from a Mongolian perspective you have to imagine it as as uh, this um, kind of uh, group of elements, of forces, of, of, of entities generally speaking that could favor them as um, as rulers and all. You have to think in these times and in, in such cultures especially that the world was looked at really believing in these things. It's not that there was a modern skepticism and criticism for which uh, these peoples were really used to reason in that fashion and it was kind of impossible to to reason otherwise it's just the most advanced civilizations of Europe, of uh, of the Muslim world, of India, of China that had started to say, okay, you know, to, to rationalize, to rationalize a little at least, to 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 start building up something more detached from more sp speculative and mm, possibly not atheist, I think atheistic, but let's say that could even criticize the idea of God as such, which is a very important step. Peoples like the Mongols really believed um, in what they believed point. They didn't have the intellectual means to, to go beyond that. Obviously when the Mongol Empire expanded and, and, and it split more than else into the various local um, um, smaller uh, khanates. Obviously, the, the Mongol rulers were extremely um, interested about literature, of philosophy. Think about the, the the Islamic world, all the traditions that existed uh, in there. And uh, um, the Mongols retained, in this sense, a great uh, taste for astronomy. As we were saying, um, looking at the sky in the steps is pr practically the best way to orientate yourself, especially when you have to go for thousands of kilometers across the step. And it happened that the, the Muslim world was extremely uh, developed in astronomy at the time of the Mongolian conquest, and therefore <laughs> you could find this. Uh, barely schooled, barely uh, literate uh, Mongolian uh, rulers to to be told at least if not really reading at least the beginning, but eventually also that by these um, scholars that, that 
believed at court and all what was about the, the skies, the planets, and, uh, and all the traditions that existed since the ancient world with the knowledge about astronomy and astrology, because astronomy and astrology weren't divided really at the time. People believed in zodiac signs and astrology as as a as a science, and but th that derived also naturally from from astronomy in the in our modern scientific apurated <laughs> way, let's say, um, science of, of what, uh, of how the celestial bodies um, really work, let's say. Um, so, um, and, and even at the court of Genghis Khan, you could find together with Taoists, uh, so with the Chinese, that there were, I don't know, other priests from other religions, basically from all over the world. Hmm? At a certain point, the Christians um, uh, by the way, uh, this is something I didn't tell, but uh, it, I can do it now without, um, uh, which is very contextual. That um, do you remember a Genghis Khan uh, wife, uh, the Karait Borte? Well, the Karaites were converted to Christian Nestor uh, to uh, Nestorian Christianism. So basically, Genghis Khan's wife was Christian. Obviously, you can opinate on how, <laughs> you know, on how more or less refined and uh, was um, Bor um, um, Borta's um, uh, knowledge of Christian theology. <laughs> Obviously, these guys were Christianized just by, superficially speaking, it was just the elites that um, converted to these um, religions just to. Uh, a bit for scaramantic reasons, a, a bit for being more presentable uh, in front of the more uh, civilized, civiliz well, most advanced civilizations that they were evidently in contact with. So this is very, very interesting. Um, so, um, and, 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 and there was a time into which the Christians, by the way, tried to convert the Great Khan eventually, and there was even this idea that the Mongols could be converted to Christianism at the end of the 13th century to to fight against the Muslims in the Near East and to basically recover the holy places like <laughs> Christian, Europeans and Mongols combined, but obviously but this is not very utopistic in practice because obviously the communications were impossible. I mean, the political and strategical uh, logics and dynamics were completely um, uh, unmanageable at, uh, at those distances. But definitely the Mongols did think to, to convert to, to Christianism. They, they took that uh, into consideration as an option. And this is very... This is very interesting, and it tells you, by the way, how Christianism was influenced. I mean, a, a great part of China at that point had been, you know, during the early Middle Ages, had been Christian, you know, this Nestorian Christians. Uh, I mean, Borte was uh, a Nestorian. So, because in China there, there were, there was a strong Christian pre presence, and uh, it kind of survived even against the repression eventually. So this is very 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 interesting and we will have to talk about that in the future possibly um, however let's talk a bit about the military <laughs> of the Mongols that you know I, I talk often about military history on my on my channel and I think it's interesting to, to, to look at that I don't have the time to really talk in um, about the Mongolian military in, in its wall, you know, that the, uh, for, for, for today, I promise I will talk about the Mongolian army in the future, and very much in detail, so don't worry. Wh what I want to remember today uh, about the Mongolian armies is of these um, armies of horse archers, um, you know, the the discipline that they had. You know, they they charged in the most absolute silence, um, guided mm, by signals and um, very call for banners, and especially carrying out their maneuvers in an absolute and frightening symmetry and coordination. I mean, these this was their f um, the fear that they uh, instilled into the enemy. 
their tactical um, uh, maneuvering was exceptional and uh, we Europeans know that because we got slaughtered by the Mongols at the Battle of Lenica <laughs> or the Battle of um, even in Hungary um, I mean we we got some of the t most terrible defeats in in chivalric history at the hands of these Mongols who had comp uh, by the way a completely different military uh, culture and ethics from our own by the way it would be very interesting to to also to discuss about how the Mongolian military uh, military actually evolved evolved um, as um, you know during the Mongolian conquests themselves because the the armies with which Genghis Khan rose to power weren't really the same armies that um, uh, his sons or, or, or grandsons guided into into uh, into the 13th century. Um, the uh, the later one were much more technological, but it wasn't really about the technology that they mostly copied from from China from they not copied but really adopted because they were the, the Mongolian Empire in this sense and the Mongolian army in turn was very multi-ethnic also in, in at some degree I mean at least the the technicians who knew how to use siege engines and stuff like that even explosive mm, bullets and stuff things like those were definitely brought from from China from other advanced uh, areas so um, the, the the Mongols were great masters of siege warfare, which is normally something that doesn't ha happen for the steppes peoples, who are notoriously incapable of of, of besieging uh, s great cities. So this meant that they had mm, s um, syncretically uh, adopted really a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, abilities from from all the peoples that they managed uh, that they, they they conquered which doesn't mean um, you know this is odd so they they just copy it that I, I always kind of I'm kind of disturbed when I hear people saying this no it's not th yeah they copied that okay uh, but I just wanted to learn that they just wanted to, to use that and that is the real edge that they had it's not it wasn't really using those weapons it was having accepted to change their own mindset to adapt to something better. This is how the Romans made it. This is how how they and the Mongolians made it. Uh, it wasn't about copying, it was about adapting and, and creating a new synthesis that nobody had ever created. I mean, the Mongolian armies have been really uh, easily, for at least medieval and ancient times, the, 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 the strongest armies evidently I mean they had they had a power a a technique uh, a logistical system a a communication a communicational system a a discipline um, um, technological knowledge that nobody had at the time combined and and that what made what made them conquering the the Eurasian continent um and uh the um so even just watching uh an ar a mongolian army maneuvering was sometimes enough for cities to surrender because they said oh my god if those guys just move so orderly so perfectly we're we're done let's surrender and let's not rebel um and uh the the the, the mongols are in, in genghis khan um are credited sometimes of having been genocidal in practice uh, in the sense that they slaughtered lots of, of people and this is definitely true um, but if you really analyze their uh, their story which is not a justification but it, it's in order just to understand how things worked at the time these massacres that to us seem barbaric and senseless were never uh, irrational at all. They were extremely, uh, even kind of mathematically calculated mm. because they had a deterrent effect mm. and, and, and if the Mongolian Empire s uh, stood in this sense so, uh, so for, for such, I mean, if, if, if it stood for, for the time it did, it was based exactly uh, 
on the base of um, on this image, this um, picture of in invincibility and inflexibility. Because if you start to be milder, uh, you're kind of gonna repent. You know, when if you want to do something, if you want to achieve that goal, if you want to keep the guide submitted, even if for his own good, it's better if you show since the beginning full full commands. Mm? And if he does something wrong, go down because by killing him, you can spare uh, the life of many others who otherwise would rebel uh, in in some measure and uh, would put you in danger but even themselves and a lot of people would get slaughtered to to a collective uh, chaos essentially so deterrence and fear uh, and the associated fear and and even the massacres that that generate uh, that generate them uh, were necessary for that world, for that empire. So, as said, as as actually awful as it sounds. So, uh, you have to reflect on such things. And uh, uh, relatively to the conquests of Genghis Khan, with with which we we close this video, um, were let's just list them. In 1211, uh, Genghis Khan uh, began the campaigns against China. In the meanwhile, between 1219 um, and 1220, the Mongols were submitting the uh, the uh, Khwarezmians, so the Khwarezmians, I don't know how you call them, um, that th was this kind of Iranian-Persian um, uh, kingdom between uh, the, the Baikal and uh, Eastern Iran. Uh, that was actually very important. There were also a lot of cities there, some of the largest cities of the world at the time, which might seem strange because today there is almost nothing left of them, but the Mongols destroyed, and by the way, a huge amount of uh, things, really, and um, this is also a price of the Mongolian conquests, uh, unfortunately. Um, they um, eventually the Mongolians took Bukhara and Samarkand, um, so they they pushed uh, west in practice, uh, and eventually uh, in from there in the north towards the Russian steppes. Here they destroyed the 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 so-called the kingdom of the so-called Great Bulgaria because uh, these were areas inhabited by these Turkic populations in in the in today's uh, southern Russia, essentially, um, that were, um, let's say, akin to the Turco-Mongolians in, in terms of uh, lifestyle, because they were they had been originally nomadic, even though they, they had begun to partially settle down, even into this world, because th that region between the Caspian Sea and the um, uh, you know the Ara Lake uh, were mm, exposed to a great deal of cultural influences, and they were in strict contact with the, um, with the uh, even with Byzantium, with the, with Iran, with the Middle East. So there were there was actually a lot of uh, um, of, uh, also of trade. Uh, the Volga River was extremely important for trade, and and that's where eventually the Mongols created uh, in the place of the Great Bulgaria the uh, the Khanate of the Golden Horde that remained there as a power, even stretching to Crimea and uh, and so on. Uh, so when Genghis Khan died in 1227, uh, his empire stretched from. Um, Siberia to Kashmir, to the Kashmir um, and to the Tibet, from the Caspian Sea to the Jap Sea of Japan. So you can imagine the the extension of this. Take any map about the Mongolian Empire; it's something huge. Mm -hmm. Many people argue, but well, but uh, most of what is there, it's 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 just it's just uh, steps. Well, not really. First of all. Um, you know, they conquered Southern Asia as well, where some of the most civilizations of the planet existed. Um, um, and we, 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 we spoke about the, the strategical importance of the Steppes Highway. Mm. It was easy to reach uh, all these lands 
of these sedentary uh, populations from the steppes, from the corridor of, of the steppes, um, which the Mongols did in an extremely quick way, by the way. Um, and, and even the steppes were populated, and they were populated by populations that, albeit not so mm, advanced, let's say, uh, mm, compared to to the one to the sedentary ones, were however pretty warlike. So the fact that the Mongolians eventually managed even to to subjugate those populations meant that they had a huge deterrent power and a huge power, a huge factual power. Uh, because those peoples were definitely not so happy to be uh, subjugated by anyone in practice, <laughs> so um, that is important to 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 stress I, I, at my advice. So what did you know? S other people argue also. You know what what this. Um, what did the great, the immense, Mongo the, the Mongolian immense genocides and great deportations of entire masses of peoples actually, um, and, and the destruction of some of the most advanced cities of the time, think about Merv, that was the most uh, populated city in the world at the time, was razed to the ground by the Mongols. Eventually Baghdad was destroyed. Baghdad had been the center of civilization uh, from 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 centuries, it was one of the most advanced mm, centers for science technology. Destroy it. Um, so, yeah, we have to reflect on this. Um, I don't want. To, I didn't want to make this video to to sponsor the Mongols, but. There is another side of the Mongolian Empire that is, it's not, um, it, I mean, I don't think these are things you have to put on the balance, because if you were, if you had been one of those guys who had his own city destroyed, you would have not give a damn about the Pax Mongolica. But if, on the contrary, you lived, I don't know, in these communities between, I don't know, Pakistan or, I don't know, West China or... Uh, whatever you know, the average um, place where you you could have been living there at the time as a peasant, as as a guy you know watching gardening goats or something like that. What you cared about was not to be harassed by brigands, for instance. The, the Mongolians built up actually a solid and pacific uh, dominion. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was how was this that story with the the virgin that could walk through the whole empire without being touched even with money on her um, this is what it was said this is also what I don't know modern totalitarianism say you know that everything was fine you know that there is no criminality or cr uh, into um, into the world it's kind of an ideal but definitely, if you look at that history, uh, on average, definitely the Mongolian Empire did pacify this huge um, Eurasian world that was uh, endemically uh, at war with itself, we can say. I mean, the Mongolians might have slaughtered I at one time even hundreds of thousands, but uh, would it, you know, the effect that it caused in terms of deterrence, do you think that it might have saved other thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands? Because I think so. I think it is possible. And in that sense, you know, the what remains is that the Mongols really changed the world. Eventually, they gave life to other powers that we remember. I don't know, in Persia and the Ilkhanate later even through Timur and uh, Babur the Conquered about the Mughal Empire uh, even in China it was essentially a Chinese Mongolian dynasty afterwards um, and they, they did achieve a lot um, and they were Mongolized in practice I mean um, th there was a vein of their genius that really did come from the now educated Mongolian elements uh, it, it was uh, it was a world in that sense where you could 
will leave relatively free regardless of language, of um, origins, of religion. That is important. That is not how we would do that, but for those time standards it was something very, very advanced, very modern in, in, the, in the ideal term that we gave, uh, we use usually. So, um, this was my true first video about the Mongols, and um, I don't know the answers. Uh, I don't know really um, what to answer to this. I mean, I don't like Mongolian genocide. <laughs> I don't like genocide in the first place, but um, sadly, life does have a cost, and and if you had been raised in that world, you you would have perfectly known what was quantitatively that cost. I mean, for, for one like Genghis Khan, who, who, or like Timujin, uh, like he was originally, who rose, you know, uh, wandering in the steps in search of food, who saw the corruption, the violence, the, the, the war of all these mm, Mongolian clans clashing against each other. I think that he was hoping for a better world in some way, from, from his point of view, naturally, not from, from, our, from our one, and, uh, and it was surely something that he did for achieving that goal. Did he manage to? I don't know, but um, this is one good reason for learning more about history, I believe. And for now, it's for today, it's all. <laughs> forgive the background noises whichever you know I've done some um, there were uh, very hard knocks I gave <laughs> uh, never mind I hope you enjoyed this video in spite of all um, I, I um, if you did please share it otherwise uh, leave a like or subscribe to my channel for receiving further contents about my my new videos and uh, if um, you know, as always, I thank you heartily for, for listening to me, which is really great. I, I see that there are people watching, so uh, I feel kind of um, very thankful to them, and I would like to express my thankfulness indeed. And as always, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!